But very clear Secretary of State view here that this is about a rigorous curriculum that's benched in, benchmarked into the, in, internationally. I think it's also important just to say something to deal with that potential caricature of this. Some people may say, you know, this is 1950s. This is going back to a kind of narrow, grad grind curriculum. Um, and it takes no account of students acquiring um, a range of skills or students developing a particular set of attributes that they'll need. Secretary State's view on that is very clear. He would argue, I have absolute agreement about the need to develop skills and attributes. Of course you have to do that. What you shouldn't try to do, however, is weave all of that into the curriculum. And he argues, and I think quite a lot of people have some sympathy with this argument, that what we've ended up doing in recent years is slightly confuse content in the curriculum with the uh, with wider attributes that you're trying to promote. Um, and the next view is, again, teachers, head teachers should decide what kind of attributes they think their students should acquire. And then they should be using the curriculum to decide how best to promote those skills and attributes. Uh, and that's a professional decision, but not something you should specify in core curriculum content. Uh, now, of course, the other thing is, before somebody points out to me, um, schools that are academies, increasing numbers, will not be bound by the national curriculum. Uh, now, you might think, well, that's a bit inconsistent. If you believe the national curriculum is that important, why are you not binding everyone into it? Secretary of State believes, I think it's a very strong argument, actually a very strong argument, that if you don't give greater independence, if you give greater independence to schools, but you preclude them altering the curriculum, what does that independence actually amount to? So having freedom over the curriculum is core to academy freedoms. I think what will actually happen in practice is if we can get the curriculum design right, and it is seen to be a now internationally benchmarked curriculum, the vast majority of people who have freedom as it were, to deviate from the curriculum, the national curriculum will probably say, actually, this pretty well works. I know there might be some modification of the margins. I think we'll have, to all intents and purposes, um, a curriculum that the vast, vast majority of schools uh, in the country will use. And um, behind all of that, well, in parallel, but behind it really in some ways, is qualifications reform. There are some changes that have been in place in recent years, put into place in recent years with qualifications. There's a bigger question that if you then reshape the curriculum, does that not have consequences for the nature of qualifications? Uh, not least through you know, assuming that curriculum content is one of the drivers uh, of the design <coughs> syllabus, which is the driver to determining the nature of your qualifications. That's, that's not happening in parallel to all of this, but expect to see more changes coming on qualifications, given the importance, again, of rigour to ensure those qualifications stand up to international standards. So a lot going on there um, under that raising uh, standards uh, ban and other things besides. So this, on, on the narrowing the gap dimension, again, um, Secretary of State would argue that the attempts of successive governments, but you inevitably would say, the attempts of the previous government have not actually helped to close attainment gaps. And his belief very strongly would be that it's where you give schools freedom to uh, design their own curriculum, to make their own choices, that they will have a better chance rather than imposing models from outside that are designed to close attainment gaps. But things like, uh, things for example, like ensuring that we are funding education, um, uh, uh, funding education, uh, sorry, education and uh, childcare for the most deprived two-year-olds across the country, ensuring that there's 15 hours entitlement for three and four-year-olds, trying to ensure that the curriculum for the earliest years through the review that Claire Tickell has done recently, all of those are designed to ensure that children entering school um, are as well prepared as possible. I would say a little bit more 
in the third set of comments, we're going to make about intervention generally, early intervention and intervention with the most difficult, uh, in the most difficult circumstances. But it is clear that the closing the gap, narrowing the gap, is a hugely significant part uh, of the policy. I want to move on then to the second big theme, which is reforming the school system, which arguably you might say has had the most publicity and has had the most um, purchase when it comes to the uh, changes, particularly through the Academies uh, Act from last year, so it's quite academy status if they wish, free schools uh, and the like. Um, now, again, it is an absolute cardinal principle to the government to maximise school-based autonomy. Absolutely crucial. They haven't done, however, um, they haven't made the decision <coughs> to impose that uh, as a requirement on all schools, believing very strongly that it will be for individual schools to decide the extent to which they wish to acquire academy freedoms. And of course, your mother numbers are um, rising all the time. I think it's important to say that uh, this is, in one sense, uh, obviously um, not an end in itself. You know, if, essentially, I think we believe that a greater independence in the system is a good end in itself, but much more importantly, the greater freedom at the level of the individual school is intended to create more opportunities for more children and young people to succeed. So it's a means to an end. So if you're concerned about raising standards, that should be your first concern, but a means to the end of raising standards should be to give as many uh, freedoms as possible to individual schools. And that will continue to be a very strong plank of policy. Now alongside that, of course, have been other attempts to uh, remove or um, downplay regulation and guidance. And one thing that I think uh, uh, most head teachers would say is that the uh, barrage of information that they might have described as it used to come out from the department and, the agency, and its agencies has very much dried up over the past 12 months. I mean, just one indicator, I think there have been six ministerial um, letters to schools over the past uh, year compared to, I think it's 45 the year before, so deliberately trying to just step back and say we don't spew all that stuff out and um, that is not what central government should be doing. Looking at, um, at minimising as far as possible guidance, I hope somebody had a chance to look at some of the consolidated guidance on things like behaviour, discipline, revised admissions code, much simpler, just trying to write um, uh, in a way that is clearer and easier to understand and not to have a whole set of regulations and guidance. So I think that's an important part of reform that you don't say on the one hand, lots of freedoms of schools and then you tie everyone up in knots. So that's a really important part. And I suppose the other element of reforming the school system is thinking about funding. Um, the uh, funding consultation document uh, went out uh, a couple of months ago, essentially saying um, for many years now people have criticised the funding system. It's been opaque, it's been complicated, it's been inequitable, and that's the kind of the most positive things you might be able to say about it. And if you're a Cambridgeshire guy, you might feel a particularly strong view, um, given the lobbying historically that Cambridgeshire has done in relation to funding. Now, what you should never assume with school funding is that you can satisfy all the people all the time. Uh, and particularly at a time uh, when budgets are tighter, Arguably, arguably, it's easier to satisfy different demands when budgets are rising. It's tight. Uh, it's much tougher when it's tight. So I think there is a question about just how we take all of this forward, and ministers will say more about that in due course. But there is a genuine recognition on the part of government that the funding system is not sustainable in its current form. And that argument has been given booster rockets by the uh, advent of the academies in such large numbers. We cannot sustain the model of funding um, 
into the medium term. And again, ministers will say more about that. But that was flagged publicly in the consultation document when it was seen to be one of the drivers for thinking differently about funding. And then, of course, on the other side of the funding equation, there's capital funding, which has been controversial, if you have to say, in the last 12 months. Um, again, uh, ministers received a report uh, about how they should allocate funding in the future for capital, and uh, we'll say more about that hopefully in the next few weeks or so. So, as a whole set of what one might describe for shorthand structural changes to the system that I think are quite profound and are already having quite an effect uh, in the system. But it's important just to keep your eye on the key. Uh, intention here, which is to maximise school level autonomy. Third final uh, comments I want to make really just to do with um, uh, intervening, uh, particularly in those circumstances where families are facing the most difficulty. The coalition feels very strongly that it did secure, even in a really tough spending settlement, funding as I described for the two year olds, most of five two year olds, the expansion of the three and four year olds funding. The advent of people premium, which will by the end of the spending review period be 1.6 billion pounds of funding allocated according to these school meal numbers. A whole set of those practical um, changes which were designed to assist the most disadvantaged. But there is also this big question which um, every school faces irrespective of its um, um, uh, uh, community, and that is those families that are the most disrupted and disruptive and what does government do to intervene in such a way to uh, deal with chaos and chaotic families and under the last administration and this administration has um, uh, taken it forward something called the family intervention projects where you try to bring together um, a, a whole set of local services and to use that rather handy old phrase tough love so you don't let people off the hook, um, but you really do um, require changes in behaviour and you deal with them really quite a firm way. Government, they would also argue that changes to the welfare system are part of that bigger picture of trying to ensure that people have a greater stake in society and don't end up causing all the kind of disruption. Because I think every senior school leader in this room and beyond would say that the amount of time that disruptive or disrupted children, young people uh, 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 generate, like time generated is often way disproportionate to the actual numbers. So the more that we can do to try to um, uh, harness the right kind of support, the better. So that's the kind of policy landscape as I see it. I'm sure there are other things that I might have touched on and I might even have missed. It's not deliberate. I'm more than happy to take any questions now, Steve, that we want. Thank you.